weapons and war 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 break it down yeah Bladed weapons were an ordinary part of the Siam male costume, at least a dagger or spear. If bound with gold or stuck with gems, these constituted an essential part of a dad's personal jewelry. We have been conducting a documentary about weapons and how war was in our country, and the HD team had interviewed the most sought after anthropologists and archaeologists all over the world. I am Francis Ira Saison, and this is Historical Documentaries. First off, Swords and Daggers. The most intimate weapon was the Baladao. This was a short broad dagger with a single-edged leaf-shaped blade like a song of spearhead and a cross-shaped hilt which was grasped with the blade protruding between the index and middle fingers. It was 20 to 25 centimeters long, with smaller ones made especially for youngsters since even a small boy felt naked without one. They were typically decorated with tassels made of silk or hairs from the bushy tail of the civet cat dyed red, or better, a lack of hair provided by one's own sweetheart. Like other bladed weapons, and even working bolos, they were strapped to the wrist for use, either by a cord or a tassel called kulili. There were two kinds of swords, kris, visayan kalis, and kampilan, both words of Malay origin. The kris was a long, double-edged blade, either straight or wavy, but characterized by an asymmetrical horn-like flare at the hilt and called kalau kalau, after the kalau hornbill. The wavy kris was called kiwo kiwo, and so was an astute, devious man whose movement could not be predicted. Hilts were carved of any solid material, hardwood, bone, antler, even shell and great battle warriors had them of solid gold or encrusted with precious stones. Blades were forged from layers of different grades of steel, which gave them a veined or mottled surface, damascened or watered. But even the best designed products were considered inferior to those from Mindanao or Sulu, and these in turn were less in steel than imports the word Kampilan came into Spanish during the Moluccan campaigns of the 16th century as a heavy pointed cutlass. Inappropriately, however, since a cutlass had a curved blade weighted toward the tip for slashing blows, while the Kampilan was straight. Modern ones are two handed weapons running to 90 centimeters. Traveled to Luzon to meet up with a very famous historian. You know, she's a Sibuana. Can you believe that? I mean, it's very fitting because we are talking about Visayan weapons. So, here is Dr. Giselle Franz Fiel. Hey, I'm Dr. Giselle Franz Galleros Fiel. Oi! Ma! Pa! No, 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 I am here to interview you about the spears and missiles. Um, what are the different kinds of spears? The first spear was Bangkau. Bangkau was the most important Visayan weapon. It was carried both for security and ceremony, and it figured not only in warfare but in religious functions and business transactions. Pamankao was a spear the bridegroom's party gave the bride's grandmother to let down the house ladder. The importance of the Visayan spear is indicated by the special vocabulary attached to it. The shaft, almost two meters long, was duldug or ilhi, and the spearhead was hafted into it by a tang, too good, and held firm by a ring called pitara if it was metal, bancorum or picket if rattan. The butt, hele, was strengthened by a pointed sheathing, or tkala, of brass or even gold for 10 or 12 centimeters. Good spears were kept highly polished and among them the most prestigious was the song. What are missiles before? I mean, how are they used? 
Missiles before were five spears thrown when it was possible to retrieve them in face to face face to face combat, for instance, or from ambush. Even when hunting wild boar or any expensive weapon was thrown with a cord attached to prevent the animal from running off with it. Normal for open combat were bamboo spears with far hardened wooden points. All these missiles were ordinarily poisoned with bullet, snake venom, preferably from a viper so deadly it was called Udto, high noon, because its victims could not expect to survive more than half a day. Bao was buzog, which basically meant full, like a head of rice or a sail swollen with wind. Ujong was arrow and tanangan quiver. However, in Panay, the arrow was called pana, presumably from Malay pana, bow. The blow gun or sumpit, as found in Sarangani and Palawan, was rather sophisticated weapon. Its length permitted great accuracy, and it was also fitted with an iron spearhead for use after all ammunition had been spent. That's all I could possibly say about missiles. Thank you. and I am here in research center of the famous archaeologist, Mr. Carlo Tige. Come in! Hello, sir. I would like you to introduce yourself. I am Mr. Giancarlo Estege, the famous archaeologist in the whole world. So, one of the defensive arms that were used is the barote, the Visayan equivalent for cuirass or chain mail. The barote was woven of thick braided abaca or bark cords, tight enough, enough to be waterproof in good ones. A piece similar to borlap is habay-habay, was worn next to the body, under the barote itself. Warriors preferred to fit without them. Pakil and batong-batong, or breastplates made of bamboo, bark, hardwood like ebony, or in Mindanao, carabao horn or elephant, hide from hulu. The shield kalasag was made of a light, Corky wood which was very strong so as to enmish any spear or dagger which penetrated it. And, it and it was generally considered sword proof. It was strengthened and decorated with binding coated with resinous pitch and of sufficient size to give full protection. Hello everyone, I am with a historian from Mindanao and so here she is. Hello everyone, I am Ms. Jara. A historian from University of Southern California. What is the most celebrated form of Visayan warfare? The most celebrated form of warfare is the sea raiding. Mangayo, a word which appeared in all the major languages of the Philippines. Its root appears to be Kayao, for example, Elokano Kinayawan, which means captive. There is no record of Visayan head hunting, that is, warfare for the specific purpose of taking heads, but heads were cut off in the course of battle or murdered. The sacrifice that was performed on launching a warship for a raid was called Pagdaga, and it was considered most effective if the pro and kill were smeared with the blood of a victim from the target community. On undefended coastal communities, they were fitted with elevated fighting decks for ship-to-ship -ship contact at sea. Such engagements were called Banga and Bangal, was to pursue a fleeing enemy vessel. Ships traveling in company were abai, and a swift sailor sent out in advance of the fleet for scouting was Dulawan, or visitor, or Lampito. Besides slaves, ranking datas jealous of their lineage were often unable to obtain brides of their rank locally or to satisfy the requirements of families with prestigious pedigrees elsewhere, and so would resort to abduction. Raiders came from as far as Mindanao and Hulu for this purpose. Two Bantayan summer chiefs made a celebration celebrated attack on Hulu, perhaps to settle bride price and social precedence. Hi everyone! I will be having an interview of the famous researcher, Mr. Agapito Estrella. I am from Historical Documentaries and I would like to know how the Visayan uh, defended themselves against the Mangayo attacks. Ah, uh, well, the great defense of the Visayan during that period was they need to intercept the enemies at the sea. Most communities did have the manual war to do so. 
the need to abandon their homes, returning when danger had passed to rebuild their houses of materials readily available. A native guide told Garcia de Escalante in 1544 that southeastern Mindanao was thickly populated with communities that had withdrawn from the coast because of war, and that Dawes, a large Bohol town opposite Panglao Island, was completely abandoned following the famous Ternatan raid only to resettle as Baklayan many years later. Malabert Kota seems to be applied in the permanent fort of Baimoros. I'm here to interview a famous anthropologist. So I'm Paolo Luis Mangihila, an anthropologist. So what can I do for you? For the historical documentaries. Um, how was the Visayan warfare during the Spanish era? So the, the Visayan warfare of the Spanish era started. Visayan life was sufficiently warlike to provide occasion for men to win the tattoos, which caused the Spaniards to call them pintados or painted. The case of Limasawa is suggestive of this warlikeness. What attracted these Butuan Rajas to this tiny island? What were they hunting? An answer is suggested by its location. It was strategically positioned to control or prey on all shipping from the Pacific coast to the interior trade centers of Butuan and Cebu. During Legazpi's first year in Cebu, he twice joined his reluctant vessel to pass to avenge attacks by enemy villages on the same island, and twice provided escort against Panay enemies for that was come to sell rice from that island. Favorite Samar targets were Albay and Catanduanes, with forays as far north as Casiguran and marriage relations with Boreas, Masbate, and Mindanao were the result of wives seeking raids from those places. The men of Eastern Samor, then called Ibabao, were still proud of their reputation as warriors in Alcina's days. Ibabao kita! They would tell each other on going into the battle, we are men of Ibabao. Boholanos, who formerly would not permit any other nation to abuse them. What are the purposes and causes of wars? The purposes and causes of wars during they are war for the Saiyan. The Saiyan communities had small populations, low levels of productions, and unlimited access to natural resources like sea and forest products. Their data's ability to procure iron or prestigious imports depended on the control of the manpower to exploit those resources. Wars were therefore bought to, con to control people, not territory. They were waged by raids intended to seize slaves outright to initiate or enforce alliance for trading networks and to take booty to cover costs in any case. Recognized causes for just wars were direct raid or attack by another community, betrayal of blood pacts or alliances, treachery or abuse of traders in a friendly village, and murder or theft by an outsider. Slave raiding was the main motivation for unprovoked attack or, in special cases, the need for a sacrificial victim to complete mourning rites for some powerful datu. And I believe that's all. Aside from the warlikeness of the Visayans before, there also existed peace pacts and the existence of the epic heroes. Peace pacts. Hostilities were suspended or avoided by Sandugo, peace pacts in which the two parties drank a few drops of one another's blood in a draught of wine. All Spanish explorers from Magellan to Legazpi made such pacts with Visayan Datus. It was a procedure by which two men, not necessarily enemies, became blood brothers, vowing to stick together through thick and thin, war and peace, and to observe mourning restriction whenever they were separated from one another. Epic Heroes Successful Mangaya raiders were regarded as popular heroes and enjoyed inter-island reputations. They tattooed in proportion to their prowess and were entitled to wear distinctive at attire. Their exploits became the stuff of local legend, and the most famous among them were Karanduun. The Spaniards, of course, considered any such venturing tattoos simple pirates, and defined Mangayo itself as piracy, armed robbery at sea. This has been a documentary about weapons and war. Again, I am Francis Ayrosaison for his